theater took on a new meaning in the Second World War. The South Pacific India Theater, the ETO, were theaters of war. But for entertainers, they were still theaters. Theaters filled with boredom, tension, and loneliness of hundreds of thousands of boys who needed songs and laughter as no other audiences in theater history. I'm Celeste Holmes, and I take great pride in being a member of the entertainment profession. I think you will see why in the story that follows. It's a sort of documentary thank you note from the United States Army to the entertainers who gave more than a quarter of a million performances in combat areas during World War II. Of course, it isn't the whole story. It can't be, because most of those performances are recorded only in the memory of those who were there. More than most professions, perhaps, mine is made up of individuals, like some of the stars you will see in this story. But it was the whole profession the well-known and the hundreds of little-known entertainers who saw that the job needed to be done and did it. In their own way, I think you can say they were soldiers too. As our trade paper here, Variety, called them at the time, soldiers in grease paint. <laughs> snow. They're pretty much the same anywhere. And before World War II was finished, there weren't many places in the world that American GIs hadn't seen. Places where we could hardly remember what it was like to be warm or dry. We're not standing in line waiting for something. Not fighting boredom or the weather or an enemy that fought back. Sure, there were doctors. But like one medic said, the only thing that can relax a body as taut as these bodies is a tub of hot water or a good belly laugh. And we can't get the hot water. Would you like some tea? Would you get some tea? Would you get some tea? Would you get some tea? <laughs> oh, Ben. Yeah. You know, when they, when they went down to North Africa, they had to take a lot of shots and things. But now in the army, it's, it's easy. Really? Why Yes, that? well, the doctors, they just take you into the room, two doctors, yeah. and one looks up your nose, and the other looks down your ear, and if they can't see you, you're in. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the way I heard it. All they do now, a doctor looks in each ear, and if they can't see each other, you're in. <laughs> and if they can, <laughs> you're an MP. <laughs> A joke doesn't have to be new to be funny. When laughter has been stored up for weeks or months, it doesn't take much to set it off. Any MP joke brought roars. A funny walk or a Hitler imitation brought down the house. Enough fields, please! Sorry, did I get on you? <laughs> laughter is the best medicine. Nobody knew that any better than Joey e. Brown, who lost a son at the beginning of the war. When that happens, he said, all other boys become your sons. And he spent the rest of the war proving it. Of course, when we first entered the war, the government was more concerned about sending soldiers overseas than entertainers. So the entertainment profession pitched in at home. They made one-night stands from coast to coast, selling millions of dollars worth of war bonds. performed at service canteens, army posts, and hundreds of training camps all over the country. They gave their time and talent from the start. And before World War II was over, more than one soldier would have Hollywood blood flowing in his veins. Matinee idols began to appear in newsreels instead of romantic leads. Jane Stewart, Jackie Coogan. The Marines had a part for Tyrone Power. Navy commissioned Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Robert Taylor was given a new role in the air. So 
is Clark Gable. This ship was launched in tribute to his wife, one of the first home front casualties, killed on a war bond tour, the beautiful Carol Lombard. You'll remember these girls as four Jills in a Jeep, Carol Landis, Kay Francis, Mitzi Mayfair, Martha Ray. They landed practically on the heels of 150,000 GIs in North Africa in 1942. Fathers of some of these boys had probably heard Al Jolson sing Mammy overseas in World War I. With him on this 40,000 mile trip in 1943 was Merle Oberon. She'd been one of the first of more than 600 performers who went overseas in our first two years of war. Entertainers like Patricia Morrison. Veterans like Frank McHugh and Alan Jenkins. You couldn't kill vaudeville, not even with this. New Guinea. Guadalcanal. The Solomon. And every fly speck island right through to Burma. The whole South Pacific War was one green hell of jungle and suffocating heat rain, mud, and mosquitoes, to say nothing of the enemy. It was a job that had to be done, and we'd be there until we finished it. But this was one party we hadn't invited ourselves to. That's why it hit us hard sometimes when these entertainers showed up out of nowhere. Like Major Melvin Douglas, heading up special services in one of the roughest theaters of war, China, Burma, India. Ann Sheridan showed up there with Ben Blue. You'd ask, what were they doing here? They didn't have to come the way we did, but they had come anyhow, stumbling over coconut trees flattened by anti-aircraft fire, pieces of exploded shells, cracked up airplanes, they were right in the midst of it, like the rest of us. The same heat, the same mosquitoes, the same chow line. The same food that you ate with teeth that felt like sandpaper. And the same enemy nuisance raids, snipers bullets, pouring rain. But they put on their two-a-day shows wherever they found us. Just by showing up, they let us know that the world we'd left behind was was really still there waiting for us when this job was done. Altogether, there was enough combat for 20 wars. But in between, time could be harder to kill than the enemy. Maybe you could dig up a corner movie. Maybe you could cheer up your girl back home with a snapshot to let her know you were keeping busy. But for real, live, flesh and blood entertainment, you usually settled for a local talent. And the three day pass just helped remind you of how far from home you really were. From the South Pacific right through India to the Middle East, you usually just put up with what you could get. That's why, as audiences, these boys made it worth anything. Scorching heat, three blankets at night, and lucky to go to bed in dry clothes. But this entertainer called the South Pacific Theater seventh heaven for any comic willing to risk his neck in it. And this one agreed. doing here? 
They might have asked that question the first time Bob Hope showed up. No GI station anywhere in the world would ask it today. You're a nice girl, too. Me too. That's a lie, and I can prove it. Well, it was here yesterday. I've been robbed. The latest dance set even reached the South Pacific, courtesy of Miss Patty Thomas. Mr. Jerry Colonna, all right. Uh. Oh, thanks to all you men dressed in khaki. You may think that I am a bit wacky. Why don't you get back in the sacky? There's room for two. Your nose and you. Uh. How about getting Miss Langford out here to sing a couple of bars? Again? T.O. in Northern Europe, some of us in the infantry thought we'd never get enough sleep again. And even when things let up, you could feel pretty low. sightseeing trip. War makes every place look the same. So instead of writing home about what you saw, you wrote what you felt or thought or remembered. Even on the Fifth Army front in Italy, sometimes everything stopped but the weather. And unless you had to write home about the more time you had to write it in. With a little luck, of course, you might get a rodeo going in an Anzio farmyard. And when winter came, you might dig in with the Andrews sisters, but the only way they could play every war theater at once was on records. Or as members of your own outfit. Yes, there were big stars and entertainers whose names had never been in lights at all. Nothing remains of the work that some of them did in World War II but a snapshot. Sometimes not even that. Because no one was there with a camera. No one was there but the audience. Three GIs in a tent or 3,000 jamming an airfield. And often enough, they were watching entertainers you may never have heard of. Not what the public calls stars, but what we people call troops, who make this a profession in which we take great pride. In World War II, they played the weeds and the thistle patches. They entertained anywhere, no matter how rough things got. They played for months at a time, giving as many as six performances a day, wherever they were booked. And then they looked for places they weren't booked to entertain there. Some were overseas for a year and more. Some were injured. And like a lot of the GIs they played for, some of these soldiers in grease paint never came back. Not that the stars weren't around. The Army called this the European Theater, and that's what it finally was beginning to look like. 
whether you hit it at showtime or chow time. Raymond Massey sampled the GI soup pail. The cast of Information, Please followed up at the sink. The ETO was one theater we didn't leave when the show was over. It was a theater we woke up in, ate in, played in, and slept in. On the foxhole circuit, Mitzi Mayfair and Jane Pickens found little room for backstage visitors. But on stage was Catherine Cornell and a dozen plays and musicals. Panama Hattie, Charlie's aunt, my sister Eileen. You were never certain of your destination. Going on tour in the South Pacific, you're prepared for anything. Who said Gertrude Lawrence couldn't slay an audience? You ready? One more. It seemed as though there were no place Ella Logan hadn't sung, but some of the preparations were more threatening than the destinations themselves. Not that Jinx Falkenberg and Pat O'Brien expected to find a Broadway stage in China. And there was so much rain in the South Pacific, Gary Cooper brought a tarpaulin to keep his act from washing away. In other theaters, any place you could drive a truck, you could collect an audience at the drop of a tailgate. When your act got too near the battlefront to risk floodlights at night, you went on at 9 a.m. and played all day. There were no ushers because most audiences brought their own seats, and the CBI theater was really off-Broadway, especially up to within four miles of the battlefront with Paulette Goddard and William Gargan. Anywhere these boys were, Lily Pons would come to sing for them. From China to the Persian Gulf Command to a concert hall in Germany. An autograph? Oh, yes, we kept right on signing. But as Bob Hope once said, they thanked us and asked us for our autograph. It was silly. We should have thanked them and asked for theirs. Of course, real troopers like this one will go anywhere looking for an audience. Always find one in the South Pacific. stayed home today. I mean, you had to be in it. Great working with Larry, though. I'm not kidding. Larry, he's a great... And the only trouble is, on this trip, a lot of times we have to room together, you know, and share the same cot. And I don't mind it so much, except that Larry is part Indian, you know? 
And every time he goes to the latrine, he takes a blanket with him. I mean... <laughs> Uh, love and Bloom, please. <laughs> I like those orchestra leaders. You'd always start out like this. Looks like you're asking the horse how old he is. You never... <laughs> Wait a minute, just one second. I want to... Hey, boys, how would you like to police this area, right? Well, Carol, bye. Good luck, honey. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Even girls like Carol Landers couldn't be everywhere at once. But they tried with Armed Forces Radio. Figure it out. Is it contagious? Or simply outrageous? Snapple. We hear it everywhere, Snapple. Is it like a pill or is it a thrill? What good is in the army? What's left will never harm me. We send our hellos and our songs and our laughter, yes, and our hearts, clear around the world to you, wherever you happen to be. was broadcasting right up on the heels of the 5th Army in Italy. Irving Berlin conducted. Here she is, lovely Miss Dietrich. Hello, boys. I want to say that sharing this entertainment with you today to me more important than doing the entertaining. If morale is kept as high, such as I've seen during my visit here in Italy, I'm certain that we can look forward to a speedy victory. Goodbye, good luck, Godspeed. Marlena Dietrich is always someone to write home about. And every day that World War II lasted, there were more boys who suddenly had little else to do but write letters home and wait for letters to come. Hospitals were filled as no war in history had filled them. Still, more came, more boys wounded in places neither doctors nor drugs could reach. Oh, movies might help these boys forget where they were for a while, but even the best movie couldn't show much personal interest in them, and that was what they needed. These hospital visits were the toughest engagements any performer had ever played. But the bravery of those boys was contagious. Maybe this wasn't a time for laughs. But no matter how banged up your body was, if you could laugh, your mind inside was still OK. And they knew that was what really counted. Seeing all this equipment here, I should have brought my mother-in-law up. She hurt her back last night. She came running downstairs, and she slipped and fell, you know. She keeps forgetting that chain don't reach to the living room. <laughs> Sure, there were times when nothing cheered you up. 
when even first-hand sympathy from some movie star you knew as well as a member of your own family just wouldn't take your mind off things. When you'd been in it for two years or three years, fighting through one smashed town after another till they all looked the same, you'd wonder if you'd ever see a city all in one piece again. You'd get the feeling it would always be like this, that it would never end, that you'd be glad to settle for one song and one dance at the stage door canteen in Paris. was over, and Europe then in the Pacific, World War II was finished. The big job was done. It was done, and the boys who had done it were ready to come home. They had earned it. But they couldn't come home all at once. It was the old army game of hurry up and wait. But now the strain was tougher than ever. For the Rockette, that just meant working harder than ever. And for entertainers like them, it still does. Because it's still going on, the fight against the boredom, tension, and loneliness of the troops overseas, who are keeping the peace they won for us in World War II. take us through Korea, right up to the present. It will take us all over the three worlds, because the Cold War can be just as hard to fight as any other kind. And our soldiers need more encouragement than a laugh and a song to win it. They need the sense of home that only contact with live performers can give them. This is why it's been a privilege for me to speak for the members of my profession who have joined in this battle and are fighting even now. 